Hi everyone, Elliot Jacobson here, and today I want to talk about the evolution of the card counting system for the Dragon 7 side bet in Easy Baccarat. And there is a story to tell here. So as usual, I have a PowerPoint and let's just get right to it. All right. So the to begin with, just some basics. The Dragon 7 originated as a side bet to Easy Bakra. Easy Bakra is a non-commissioned variant of Bakra where the way you would avoid commission on a banker bet was by choosing a specific hand and having that hand that, if it won, pay slightly less. So you would choose a rare hand, and in this case that rare hand was a banker three-card winning seven, and it would pay less, and uh, in the case of this variant, it would simply be a push. So if you made a banker bet and the banker won with a three-card winning seven, it would be a push. Um, this gives rise very naturally to a side bet, and some kind of think of this as a type of insurance, that you would make a bet that the banker hand would win with a three-card um, winning seven, total of seven, and that side bet was called the dragon side bet, the dragon seven side bet, and it paid 40 to one um, whenever that event happened, a banker winning a three card total of seven. Otherwise, it lost. And this side bet quickly gained uh, a lot of popularity um, in Easy Bakra. And this pair of Easy Bakra and Dragon Seven was sort of making the rounds as. Um, an international superstar of a variant of the game. So Easy Bakra, it moved faster because you didn't have to take commissions, and this side bet had a nice juicy house edge, and so there's lots of money to be made additionally by uh, having players make this side bet. Now we can actually get the combinatorial analysis just so that we're all together on this. The side bet for the Dragon 7 we see right here has a house edge of 7.6113%. So that's a very decent house edge on a side bet. And most players who played Easy Bach would want to make this side bet. Um, and so the game was performing terrifically and it was going gangbusters really internationally getting into hundreds and hundreds of the casinos and the people who invented this game were on speaking tours. I heard them, one of them speak one time at a conference and um, the company that produced a DEQ was doing very well. And um, along I came one day in the summer of 2011 and I had been reading on various websites that um, people were trying to figure out how to card count the Dragon 7 and I had a history a little bit of a history with with such work having devised a card counting system for lucky ladies I don't know, seven or eight years earlier, but I did not do very much over the years with card counting side bets. But I've been following this discussion online and people were conjecturing that um, a shoe rich in face cards, zero valued cards in Bakra and sevens would be more likely to give rise to a total of seven and therefore um, the there was going to be a winning dragon hand. And I was thinking about that off and on, but I hadn't really come to any conclusions. Um, and then Mike and I, uh, as you can see in this picture, we took a hike together in early September of the year 2011. And I believe this is the summit of Red Cap, which is one of the um, easier climbs in Red Rock, which is a, a beautiful um, park just uh, west of Las Vegas with lots of great hiking trails. And Mike is really great when you go on a hike with him. He will talk about anything. And a lot of times we would talk about physics and cosmology and uh, just very strange topics that I really enjoyed. And, and one of the topics we started discussing was this Dragon 7 bet. And somewhere during our hike, it occurred to me that maybe people were going about this thing all wrong, that the way to think about the Dragon 7 was not to focus on the 7 aspect of it, but, but rather to focus on the necessity to have three cards in the banker's hand. 
And then once you sort of take that step, it becomes very intuitive because which cards are the most notorious for stopping a hand dead in its track in Baccarat? Well, it's eights and nines because you get a natural and the hand is over. So eights and nines, when you had a shoe rich in those, would prevent the shoe from being dealt a third card. Um, so one of the things in order to get a third card would be to have eights and nines um, have low density, have not very many of them in the shoe. But then you think, well, the, the banker is going to have to be dealt a third card. And what card added to the banker's hand is going to get to seven? Well, bankers always draw on zero, one, and two, and most of the time on three. So what you're going to want there is for zero, one, two, and three, you're going to want seven, six, fives, and fours, so that the total will be seven. So very naturally, to beat this side bet, you want a shoe rich in um, four, five, six, and sevens and having a depleted number of eights and nines. And so when I went ahead and worked out the math on this thing, that came out uh, to this card counting system. This is the dragon count, that eights and nines get a plus two, that four, five, six, and sevens were minus one, and that all the other cards would get a zero. Well, Mike had told me that if I could work this whole thing out, then he would publish it on his website, Wizard of Odds, which is really um, quite a, an amazing offer. You don't get those offers very much. At the time, his website um, was getting easily 30,000 hits a day internationally, I believe. Um, so I knew that if I published this article, it would get a lot of reads and it might help my career at the time to become better known for my own skill set. So just to go through some of what I did, I ended up um, running a simulation of 200 million shoes on an eight deck game with the usual burn card rule off the top and the cut card at 14, which is sort of a typical place for the cut card internationally. And when I ran the simulation, these are the numbers I came up with, that using the count system on the previous slide, you would make a bet whenever the true count was plus four or higher. And then when you did that, on average, when you made a bet, your edge over the house would be about 8.03%. That you would, on average, be making a Dragon 7 bet about 9.16% of the time. So, so about once out of every 11 hands or maybe um, six or seven times a shoe, the numbers would come up so that it would be a good bet to make. Then I was also able to just to compute the win rates. And the key win rate um, was the win rate per 100 hands was 0.736 units. And this is a non-trivial win rate. Um, for those who know what the desirability index is, I have that there for you as well. So what does that win rate of 0.736 translate to? Well, what it means is that if you had a player who was sitting next to the table, just back counting the table, and they only made the bet whenever it was plus four or higher, um, and they were making $100 wagers on the side bet, then that person who was focusing just on beating the side bet and nothing else would win at a rate of about $73.60 per 100 hands. Well, a shoe is about 80 hands. It takes an hour and a half. So maybe this is two hours every two hours. So you're about $35 an hour as a salary just watching the game with $100 bets. That's not a bad living wage for a guy. So yeah, it seemed like it was definitely a vulnerability, um, not nearly the vulnerability of a game like Lucky Ladies, where you could easily earn over $100 per 100 hands and the game moved much, much faster. So this, in my opinion, was a, a medium to small opportunity. I did not expect that um, it was going to make much of a dent in the universe of advantage play. But at any rate, um, what happened was that Mike liked my article after I submitted to him and he published it. And if you read in the fine print here right at the top, you will see, excuse me, that it was published on September 30th of 2011. 
Well, September 30th was a Friday, the last Friday of the month. And just by coincidence, just by pure coincidence, by the way, this is how the article looks today. If you want to go um, tracking down my original article, go to the Wizard of Odds uh, com website and just do a search for card counting the dragon bet. In, in fact, if you just type that into Google, you'll get to this article. So if you do want to read it, um, you can find it on Mike's site as it currently looks. And um, one other thing, just to before I get to sort of what happened next, this um, particular slide shows you that just uh, five days later, this other brilliant programmer, his name is Stephen Howe, um, saw my work and he sort of improved on it actually by giving an unbalanced count and a tracking sheet that allowed you to sort of beat the bet without having to convert to true counts. And what I want to say is Stephen Howe not only did this, but he also confirmed my own results for me. Before I published my work on Mike's site, I wanted to have a second opinion. Um, it was the very first time I had ever done a Bakra side bet analysis, and I wasn't entirely comfortable with my code. Uh, but Steve double checked my work and he affirmed that I had gotten accurate results. And then he improved it, which is what you would hope someone would do. I mean, it's it's out there to be improved. So thank you, Steve. And I do recommend if you're interested in the world's easiest way to beat the Dragon 7, his method is easier than mine. So I mentioned the 30th of um, September. That was the day that I published the article right here. And what I want to just point out to you is what was happening next week. Well, we had the October 1st, October 2nd, and then we had the Global Gaming Expo 2011. And honestly, it hadn't even occurred to me that, that my article was um, coming out so soon before G2E. It was just a, the time that it came out. It was just random. And um, it turned out, though, <laughs> that it ended up um, having a profound impact in casting a shadow over G2E for a lot of people. And so I want to just talk about some of what the experience was like. I went to G2E not knowing what was going to happen or what had happened with my article. But if you think about the date it was published, um, and the fact that Mike's site was getting 30,000 hits a day, then you would realize that my article became sort of well-known internationally almost immediately. It was viewed hundreds of thousands of times over the first week. And um, I would say there was a global freak out. That's the only way I could really honestly describe what happens, an absolute global freak out about the uh, Game Easy Bakra, the Dragon 7 side bet, and was this game and this product even viable anymore? Should a casino even have this game or was the game just dead and gone? Had I killed the game? That was the level of freak out that I encountered. Um, so as you see, here is G2E and October 3rd to 6th, right there. So let me just sort of show you a picture if you haven't seen a picture of G2E. And so there is, you know, there's a huge floor show with all these companies um, showing off their table games and their slot machines and every other sort of widget you might imagine is in a casino, is on display um, at these exhibitions, the Global Gaming Expo. So this picture um, is just a, a sample of a, a crowd scene from the 2011. You see Shuffle Master, right? Shuffle Master was in direct competition, by the way, with DEQ, the maker of Easy Bakra. So, okay. When I got there, I started hearing rumors. Almost immediately, people were telling me things that were going on. So I heard a rumor, and this is completely unverified that one of the largest shareholders in DEQ, after my article had come out, um, had sold half of his shares in the stock. 
Um, I've tried to do a historical stock price search on DEQ. They were delisted in 2017 and I can't find uh, the stock prices from early October 2011. I would be very interested in knowing whether there was a dip in stock price that day. But yeah, someone told me that that um, essentially the, the stock lost a lot of value that day. I was told that casinos all over the world were closing their easy bakra tables, that the games were being shut down, that until they figured this thing out, they just shut the tables. Now, they weren't saying they were going to get rid of the tables, but they, they just shut them down. They needed more information. They, they needed to know what was going on here. So my little article had caused uh, tables of Easy Bakra internationally to be closed. I was told that DEQ wanted to sue me. I was told this by more than one person. Um, so yeah, I could imagine they would want to sue me. This would be, um, if my results were incorrect, it would be um, easily could be liability. I could have cost them, you know, fortunes um, if all these people suddenly don't want their game based on false information I had published. So yeah, um, they definitely wanted to sue me. And then uh, again, that's a rumor, an unconfirmed rumor. Another unconfirmed rumor was that there was uh, that Shuffle Master had put me up to some sort of conspiracy that I had been hired by Shuffle Master to uh, as a hired gun to take down Easy Bakra because that was such a, a popular game and it was competing. Um, you know, there was a strong product on the market competing against uh, Shuffle Masters collection of games. So this whole Shuffle Master conspiracy and many, many people apparently thought this was true. I was getting this from many different sources. Um, so yeah, Shuffle Master conspiracy. Um, then there was a number of things I was told firsthand by um, key players. So for example, I had a conversation with Max Rubin and Max was the one um, who told me uh, almost immediately when I arrived there the first day, that Elliot, you are the shit show of uh, G2E 2011. And what he was saying is that I was the only thing anybody was talking about, that this article I wrote, that it had just gone on, that you, no matter where you went, that was the buzz, right? That um, I had done this thing to DEQ and all the conjectures about why I had done it and was it accurate and what was DEQ going to do and all those sorts of things. So yeah, um, I remember that conversation quite clearly and I will just say that aside from, you know, secondhand accounts of things that he gave me, the firsthand thing that he told me was that I was the shit show of G2E 2011. Um, I did have a conversation after Max, I went straight over to the DEQ booth and um, attempted to corner um, the CEO, Earl Hall. Um, very nice guy, very professional. He was extraordinarily agitated. And one of the first things he did um, after I apologized to him, I said, look, I, I didn't mean to cause you this trouble, is he held up his um, phone and he said, he said, Elliot, I have 140 messages from directors of table games from casinos around the world all asking what the F is going on with your game. And I've got to call each one of these people back. Thanks a lot. So that was one thing he, he said right to me. And I, I really empathize with that. I mean, I, I certainly didn't mean to cause him that trouble, but I could see it. Everybody who has his game wants to have a good, is Elliot right? You know, what are you going to do about it? Um, and at some point, I believe he said to me, but, but later this was um, denied and I haven't been able to find any evidence to back up this memory, but I, I remember him telling me he was a speaker in some session and that he the talk he was going to give he couldn't give anymore because of this he had to completely change his talk and you know he's, he's there at the show it's not like he has time to prepare another talk um, and then he asked me whether I would help him 
prepare a statement on the game that expressed um, what I had told him, that I felt this was not a particularly big advantage play vulnerability. And he asked whether I would cooperate with him in writing such a statement. And I said, absolutely, absolutely I would. Um, I, I still feel bad for the guy to this day, but um, he was really under a stressful situation. He didn't hate me, all right? He was just, he was just pissed at the world that this had happened at that moment. Um, I, after I came home, I had a conversation with an Advantage player from the East Coast who called me. I don't know how he got my phone number. And, and he said um, that he had found a game where he had, he had already known this counting system and apparently been doing it, and that he had been playing um, three hands of $300. $300 was their max bet. So $900 at a time on the Dragon 7 bet. And if $100 will bring you $70 per hundred hands, then $900 will bring you $630 per hundred hands, which is a very comfortable living. So he was making his li living card counting the Dragon 7, $600 per hundred hands, which comes out to maybe $300 an hour. And so in the phone call, he was very short with me and just said, um, his quote was, Elliot, you don't mess with a man's livelihood. And the first time I really heard it put that way, that my work was directly interfering with how another man was making a living. And um, yeah, I did not take it as a threat, though in retrospect, I assume it was. Uh, a threat. It was an intimidation. And a um, couple years later, in fact, maybe three years after this, I happened to run into the chairman of the board for DEQ, who was a director of table games also at a casino. And he told me the inside story um, of the board meeting after my, the emergency board meeting after my article was published where they had wanted to sue me. And he had told me that he had stood up for me in that board meeting and asked the question to, the, to everybody in the room, is Elliot right? Is what Elliot put out there correct information? Because if it is, we can't sue him. Because um, the truth is the ultimate defense against libel. And so this director of table games told me that he had defended me in that board meeting. Um, and I so appreciate that because not only was he right in his argument, but it was also the right thing to do, right? And he had stood up for someone he didn't necessarily like or care about or feel like any obligation, but he still did it just on principle. So very good, very good, thank you for that. Now, I want to show you the press release that DEQ put out. And this was put out on December, on October 3rd, 2011. Now, what's auspicious about that date is that is the first date of G2E that year. And what we see is that DEQ unveils Panda 8 for Easy Bakra. So the big thing that DEQ had in mind for 2011 was they were unveiling this new side bet um, called the Panda 8 to accompany their Dragon 7. And the Panda 8 is a side bet that where you bet that the player will have a three card winning total of eight. I think it paid 25 to one. So it was just a different version of the Dragon bet only for the, um, the player side. And so this was their big reveal at G2E, but unfortunately what I did completely overwhelmed them so that this news got buried. But what they did do right at the last minute was add a paragraph to the end of this press release as a result of the article I published. And I will show you a close up of that uh, press release right here. They added, Independent studies have proven that all the various attempts to count easy Bakra and or its side bets is impractical. 
and that the best practices that govern operating the game when followed provide for an optimal gaming experience that benefit both the player and the casino. Now, I just disagree with this. I, I, first of all, they didn't have time yet for their independent studies. So I'm not, it's not clear that they actually did these independent studies. Um, and it's also, I don't agree that card counting its side bets is impractical. Now they're right, card counting the main game doesn't work, but the side bet, yeah, it's kind of practical. So I wasn't really fond of the fact that they added this because it seemed like they were trying to, um, you know, color the thing, wash it under the rug without really getting to the meat. But I added something to my own article after speaking to Earl. What I added to my article was, this analysis shows that in theory, the dragon side bet in Easy Bakra is an advantage play opportunity using a card counting methodology. In my opinion, however, given the high variance and low return, card counting is not a practical threat to the game. So what I was saying is, look, this is a long shot bet winning the dragon, 40 to, um, 40 to one. You don't win it very often, right? Even the advantage player is gonna lose 38 times for every one they win. The one they win will pay 40, so they'll, that's how they make their profit, but they're going to be losing 38 and winning one. So because of the high variance, and remember this thing I called the desirability index earlier, this just does not rank high up in advantage player um, dreamland. But it is a, a way to beat the game, so, you know, it's, it's, I would never do it. I would never recommend it to anyone to do it, but there were people doing it, and after my article, it became very clear that, that there were teams internationally beating this game. Some of them before I published my article, a great number after I published my article. And over the years, the Dragon 7 has had to have some reasonable defenses like the cut card rather than being 14 cards from the end is one, one and a half decks from the end. And that's pretty much protected the game. So. Um, one could argue that DEQ, if they say that if you um, use their best practices, if their best practices included um, cut card at one and a half decks, then yes, they would be correct also. And, you know, this reminds me of something, and I did not post this email I got, but I just want to say I received an email where essentially what the person said was that... Um, representatives from DEQ, every time they would go out and try and sell Easy Bakra and the Dragon 7 bet, would run into the question, well, isn't it countable? Isn't it countable? Can't you count that? And can you just be imagine being a salesman for this product and you run into that over and over again and just how, how frustrated you would get. And so I had an email from someone talking about how um, one of these salesmen um, just started making things up that weren't true to him. And um, yeah, so I'm not saying all of DEQ did that or that was their policy or anything, but I could imagine a frustrated salesman wanting at some point to not lay it all on the line. All right, the upshot of all of this was that I realized that this overreaction was a symptom of an industry that was starved for information. I mean, James Grosjean had Beyond Counting and all the Advantage players knew tons of ways of getting huge edges. But at the time I wrote that article, there essentially was not good information out there, um, you know, laid out in a way that was easily accessible where people in the industry could really understand the ways their games were being beaten and be able to judge the different vulnerabilities for these methods. So it was my experience with the dragon and this overreaction that inspired me to start my um, website, AP Heat. I only started AP Heat because um, I wanted to put every game out there figure out how to beat every game, show exactly this counting system and the house edge, and here's how bad it is, and here's what you can do to defend it. And let's just put out all this information, and the more information I put out, the less scared people got of 
card counting side bets or um, edge sorting or hole carding or collusion at, at the games or loss rebates. I mean, the more you put out there, right, what happens? Well, the smart casinos learn this stuff the smart players learn this stuff and they go to less smart casinos where they can get away with it. Um, but it's information. Information does the greatest good in the public domain. Let those people who are willing to do the work reap the benefits. And if that's an advantage player, so be it. And if it's a, um, um, a casino that really wants to invest in educating its staff about advantage play, they will be able to run a very secure um, business there. So that experience um, with the Dragon was the genesis of AP Heat. Now, interestingly, the Dragon 7 patent actually expired. It expired in 2013. And at that time, Shuffle Master was able to um, well, start putting out their own version. They call it the Fortune 7. And you see the Dragon 7 on other games under other names internationally now as well. Essentially, anybody can put a side bet on a Bakra game where a um, banker three card seven pays, winning three card seven pays 40 to one. And they could call it whatever name they want. Fred side bet, for example. And essentially they have the same game that was easy bakra with the dragon seven so that patent expired and so that business is over with and what happened to me was that my work at ap heat turned into my book right so this book that i wrote is essentially 175 articles on how to beat various games that i wrote purely motivated by the ignorance that that sort of um, confounded me and overwashed me at that G2E in 2011, that that ignorance inspired. So I went on about a three and a half year rampage of just figuring out how to beat everything and turned it into this book. This book is available on amazon.com today. And you might notice that the little 772 logo in the lower half corner is the logo I use for my um, YouTube channel advanced advantage play. So, all right, everyone, um, that's the end. I hope you all have a great week and a pleasant holiday season, no matter what part of the world you're in. Here in Santa Barbara, we are staying inside and having no company, but hopefully better days are ahead soon. All right, everyone, this is Elliot Jacobson. See you later. Mm -hmm.